I could describe him to you, but he, he's indescribable. He's indescribable. Yeah. He, he's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. I'm trying to tell you, the heavens of heavens cannot contain him, let alone a man explaining him. You can't get him out of your mouth. You can't get him off of your hands. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. And Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. That's my game. Yeah. He always has been, and he always will be. I'm talking about he had no predecessor, and he'll have no successor. There was nobody before him, and there'll be nobody after him. You can't even teach him, and he's not going to resign. That's my game. Here's the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Hey! All the power belongs to my king. We around here talking about black power, and white power, and green power, but it's God's power. Time is the power. Yeah! And the glory. We kind of get prestige and honor and glory for ourselves, but the glory is all his. Yes! Time is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. How long is that? And ever and ever and ever and ever. And when you get through with all of the forever, then amen. All right, welcome back, friends, to our Bible study. Matthew chapter 12 is where we have been going through. And if you remember, we have been talking. Jesus has been in a confrontation with the scribes and Pharisees, uh, the Jews. And the primary theme in this chapter, he's the Lord of the Sabbath in the beginning. Then he deals with a man with a withered hand. He heals him on the Sabbath day, showing that he's the Lord of the Sabbath, and it's okay to do good on the Sabbath day. We see some prophetic scriptures in the middle about him being God's chosen servant, quoting Isaiah. Matthew brings this out. Then Jesus, uh, there was one brought unto him, possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and noticed how the devil hindered this man physically and Jesus healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw now when he means dumb it means he can't speak not that he has a, a mental issue and the people were amazed and so the Pharisees piped in and said that this man did it by Beelzebub the prince of devils and so Jesus goes through the discussion that a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand or shall not stand and that he did his miracle by the power of the Holy Spirit and that all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So there is a point of no return that you can reach. When you irrefutably sense that God has done a miracle, and it's unquestionably a good miracle, from the Spirit of God undeniably and you in your heart the hardness in, in this the sin that is in your heart you refuse by an act of your will you refuse to acknowledge this was good and this was God in your pride you resist knowing in your heart that it was good and you're calling it evil and so at that point, you can cross a point of no return. 
where you sin against the Holy Spirit. And what more can the Holy Spirit do to draw you into the kingdom of God when you reject his voice, his outward manifestation of power so willfully, so um, outwardly, so undeniably, and you're unwilling at that point. You just harden, you set your, your jaw, your shoulder against the Lord. There's no more the Lord will do for you. He will leave you to yourself. And that is a horrible, horrible position to be in. And these men were crossing that line or had already crossed that line. So it's something to beware in our own hearts that we don't let pride enter in. We know that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We have to humble ourselves in the sight of God and he will surely lift us up. But we, it starts with submission. It starts with resisting the devil and he will flee. We have to resist the devil. We have to cleanse our hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. I'm quoting out of James 4. And we will be lifted up. When we humble ourselves, we will be lifted up. But when we dig in in pride, God will resist us to the point of no return where you can harden yourself, stiffen your neck so much as the Bible says, the Holy Spirit will, you'll grieve the Holy Spirit. He'll leave you to yourself. Um, in the end, it would have been better if you had never been born, just as Judas. Jesus said that of Judas. So Judas continually hardened his heart, seeing the mighty miracles that God was doing. He hardened his heart against it. And the love of money, you can't serve God or money or mammon. You'll love one and hate the other or hold to one and despise the other. Uh, you know what you know what you esteem in your heart that's going to be your master and so that's the state of Judas and he uh, Jesus said it had been better that he had never been born he had committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit so what a sobering message now he goes in right springboarding right from this so it's the same conversation he says a tree is known by its fruit Okay, we go into verse 33. And I'm trying to get it to show here. Okay, we're back. So it says, either make the tree good and his fruit good. Now notice, it talks of the tree being, having a personhood. At, you know, saying his, referring to him as a him. Either make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt for the tree is known by his fruit O generation of vipers how can ye being evil speak good things for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks a good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things but I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment for by your words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Okay, so this is relating the words that you speak is directly proceeding, connected to the inner part of your man, the spirit, the heart. And so what is coming out of you is reflected in your words. And it can be corrupt fruit or it can be good fruit. Notice that it's related to fruit. For example, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the issues of character, the love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, self-control, faith is one of them also. Uh, these are the matters of the heart and what you how you allow yourself to be influenced by the Holy Spirit in you allowing those good works of character to come out of your life and you know it's it's a battle it's a it's a constant denying yourself and reckoning yourself dead to your own will and humbling yourself when you cross the line in pride and yielding yielding your heart to the Holy Spirit 
in these areas because he'll this is how he deals with humanity with this these character issues so these proceed from the heart and when you're born again your spirit is joined to the holy spirit it and that joining is like a, a matrimonial union between you and the lord and it is proceeding from that union your uh these issues of character but you have to allow it your free will which is the executive branch of your being of your personhood he's the judge the free will makes the judge it sits on the judgment seat and allows what's going to come out you're influenced by your reason and you're influenced by your emotions and obviously you want to keep your emotions in check under your reason your reason is to be influenced by the word of god and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god so when you make a decision you are your reason which is influenced by the the word of god this in the leading of the spirit that's what's to proceed um, those are the judgments that should proceed from the executive side of your being which is uh, your free will the executive branch i should say all right so that's a little bit of our makeup and how we should act and uh, you know what fruit we should allow come forth in our lives it can be corrupt fruit jesus said that if our eye was evil in the sermon on the mount um, the light would not be in us our guiding principle would be darkness and if it was darkness how great would that darkness be so um, but it was to be clear he said your eye should be single or pure or clear that way the light can penetrate in it you're allowing god's influence into your life you have an open teachable heart a humble heart to the lord allowing his word his spirit to guide you and you're not going to stumble in that in that position and so you as an as a result of that you are going to have good fruit you're going to bear good fruit now let's uh let's add on here to what albert has to say so it says now and let's jump back to verse 33 he says either make the tree good and his fruit good so the fact asserted in this verse is that a tree is known not by its leaves or bark or form but by its fruit and that's a, an, an excellent point because when you're in the middle of the forest and it's winter time and all the leaves are gone all the fruit is gone it's very difficult to know what kind of tree is what just by looking at the bark even if it has leaves on it and no fruit it can be challenging but there are distinctions if you have a trained eye you can know what an oak tree's leaf looks like versus a maple tree uh, versus um, a birch tree or a willow tree um, or an ash tree or a poplar and so forth so it's easier to identify a tree with the leaves even more so with the fruit you know if you see an orange or an apple or a pear or a banana coming off it's easily identifiable there there's color associated with the fruit and shape associated with the fruit pleasing to the eye um, so jesus is saying the tree is known by its fruit so the application to the argument is this you are to you are to judge of man's being in league with satan by his works right that's what jesus said in the sermon on the mount he said beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they're ravenous wolves you'll know them by their fruits you don't gra gather figs from thistles or um grapes from thorns right so a good tree is is known will have good fruit and a corrupt tree will have evil fruit then they'll never get switched but therefore by their fruits you shall know them so you're to judge whether a man is in league with satan by his works remember jesus said in john chapter 8 that you are of your father the devil 
And then in 1 John 3, he that commits sin is of the devil, right? So these are the works Jesus beware, be, beware his disciples to look out for or warned his disciples to look out for. We're to judge then whether a man is in league with Satan by his works. If my doctrines and works be properly the works of Satan, then I am corrupt. If not, then your charge is blasphemy. Remember? So we just talked about blasphemy in verse 32. And here was Jesus' works, the works of Satan. Was his doctrines the works of Satan, of healing, of setting men free from captivity and bondage of demonic possession? Absolutely not. And so they were misjudging the fruit and it was a charge of blasphemy. So on the other hand, if in spite of this, your professions, your works are the works of the devil and your doctrines are such as he would teach, it would prove respecting you that which you charge on me. Whoa, that's tough. So I think it's saying that your doctrines can be potentially right, but your fruit is evil. Let's read that again. So on the other hand, if in spite of this, your, prof your professions, in spite of your professions, your works are the works of the devil, and your doctrines are, are such as he would teach, okay, as the devil would teach, it would prove respecting you that which you charge on me. So he's saying that their works and their doctrines are that which the devil teaches, but they're trying to reflect it, that Jesus is doing these things, but it's they're trying to switch the script and say what they do is not of the devil what jesus is doing of the devil so they're calling good evil in evil good so in this direct indirect but powerful manner he advances to the charge against them which he urges in the following verses okay so this is the charge jesus is, is making and he he says it plainly in verse 34 and 35 he says oh generation of vipers he calls them snakes Christ here applies the argument which he had suggested in the previous verse. They were a wicked race, like poisonous reptiles, with a corrupt and evil nature. All right, so we can't trust a snake. You know, it just blows my mind when I see people who take for pets snakes. And in the end, you never know that snake could bite and turn on its master because it's a snake after all in its heart and it has very little to no zero affection and yet you are trying to keep it as an affectionate pet so they're poisonous reptiles with a corrupt and evil nature they could not be expected to speak good things that is to speak favorably of him and his works so you can't because they're hardened to sin you can't expect them to speak good of what jesus is doing as the bad fruit of a tree was a proper effect of its nature right the sap that is within the tree the fruit that it's going to bring forth whether it's thistles or thorns or something untoward or or nasty it's in, it's because of the dna of that tree the sap that is in that tree and what it is capable of producing so is it with a snake so so were their words about him and his works the proper effect of their nature so this is all what's in the heart of the pharisees you can see the evilness by the words that they speak it's reflected in their speech their words betray them betray what's in their heart you want to know what they're thinking and well judge them by their words because out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks jesus is drawing that connection here so the abundance or fullness of the heart produced the words of the lips say that again the abundance or fullness of the heart produced the words of the lips now vipers are a poisonous kind of serpent 
but not often a yard long or about three feet and about an inch in diameter having a flat head the males have two large teeth though or through which a most deadly poison is thrown into the wound made by the bite so it says though they have two little holes in the end of these uh, teeth these fangs that inject uh, they pressurize it and inject they open the wound with their teeth and then out of these holes in, is injected the poison into their victim so the, the, they have these two large teeth through which a most deadly poison is thrown into the wound made by the bite they are an emblem of malignity and mischief these were strong expressions to be used by the meek and lowly Jesus but they were not the effect of anger and malice they were a declaration of the true character of the people with whom he was conversing a declaration most justly deserved and there is a quote here matthew 3 7 let's look at that but when he saw many of the pharisees and sadducees come to his baptism this is john the baptist he said unto them o generation of vipers who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come so john john the baptist knew and saw what these guys what these characters were like and he could see the fruit the fruit that was born out of these men he knew that they had evil intent in their heart he listened to their speech he saw their works how they betrayed him he knew who their father was john was a was a a pure genuine honest servant of the lord okay so now verse 36 he but jesus continued and said but i say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment so jesus closes this address to his malignant and wicked hearers by a solemn declaration that for these things god would bring them into judgment therefore they who had spoken so malignantly against him could not escape right so this is this is in reference to the blasphemy of the holy spirit that every idle word that these men shall speak we're going to be taken into account against them and so is it with every human being we have to watch our speech now idle word let's look at that this literally means a vain and thoughtless a vain and thoughtless a vain would be useless um, no value uh, not good thoughtless meaning it came out quick it proceeded it skipped the reason in your mind your filter you know how people talk unfiltered and they don't really think it just proceeds from the innermost part of their being their heart and it's a useless word it, it, it's no value to the hearer no value no instruction uh, it could even be negative and destructive a word that accomplishes no good so it accomplishes nothing good you know it's not a word of encouragement it's not a word of um, advice or wisdom no it it's the opposite in fact it can hurt someone or confuse someone or be foolish have no meaning here in this context it it means evidently wicked injurious false so wicked meaning an evil intent behind it injurious it's spoken to hurt to injure someone it's false all lies hurt people it's you know you don't you're not to lie against your neighbor neighbor bear false witness against him because it hurts them malicious uh, again harmful for such were the words which they had spoken this is what jesus is referring to here now verse 37 for by your words you shall be justified and by your words you shall be condemned 
So that is the words are the indication of the true principles of the heart. By words the heart shall be known, as the tree is by its fruit. If they are true, proper, chaste, instructive, pious, good, they will prove that the heart is right. If they're false, envious, you know, how many words are spoken out of envy, jealousy, hatred, gossip, malignant, and not good or impious, they will prove that the heart is wrong, it's evil, it's corrupt, and will therefore be among the causes of condemnation. These words are going to be used, they're recorded, they're going to be used against you when you stand before the Lord at your death. By your words, you're going to be justified, and by your words, you're going to be condemned. So it is not meant that words will be the only thing that will condemn man, but that they will be an important part of the things for which he shall be condemned. Now, let's look at some scriptures. James 3. James 3 through 12. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor or the the um, the governor desires, the the driver, the captain of the boat, he desires. So even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. So the tongue is a very little member of your body, you know, in conjunction with your arms or your legs or your eyes or your nose or your ears. The tongue is a little member. And it's just a little member, right? It can't do much harm. But it boasts great things. So imagine your words. They are started in your heart as a thought. And they proceed from there out your vocal cords. You vibrate your vocal cords. Your brain gives the command to, to, to move your vocal cords. And your tongue then projects it, projects that air out into the atmosphere. Where it's moved through the air in sound waves. And it's picked up at these frequencies. These pulses are picked up by a receiver, a human being's ear. You can hear your own speech. And you can hear the speech of others. They can hear your speech if their ears work properly. And, uh, you know, that's how the words come out. So your tongue is the projector, this, the amplifier of your thoughts. You're able to speak now if your if your voice doesn't work you can use hand signals right that's what sign language is so but again you can you know you're probably going to be more controlled using sign language as opposed to how quick your tongue can speak something so this is little member and it boasts great things it's it's allowing the thoughts and intents of your heart to be manifest to everyone around so behold, how great a, a matter a little fire kindleth, right? So when you start a forest fire, or if there's a forest fire started, it can be started by a bolt of lightning. It could be started by a campfire that wasn't put out correctly. Uh, you know, it, it can be a little fire, but it can light a greater fire because fire can spread given the right fuel given the right oxygen it can spread very rapidly you know if, if it's damp out and there's a lot of moisture it's not going to spread quickly but if it's dry if there's a lot of dry wood around hasn't rained in a while then that fire can can uh, can spread very rapidly and this is what James is comparing the tongue to your tongue is a little member just as this little match is a little match, but that match can turn into a great forest fire. 
but in your tongue can boast great things. It can create that reaction, that chain reaction very quickly that can spread. You know, you, you've heard it through the grapevine, how the grapevine spreads. They hear your words. It's, it's repeated. It's repeated. It's repeated. It creates this firestorm of controversy. Your words, when they are projected into this world, they can create a fire storm of controversy if they're bad words even good words you know jesus was hated for what he spoke his words create controversy they do they did then they do now it's a sword right the sword of the spirit so even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth and that's an exclamation that's put in there by the translators and the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity wow so the tongue is a fire imagine your tongue is a fire a world of iniquity so of lawlessness almost i would i would look at that you know iniquity is lawlessness so is the tongue among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell now what i believe this means it can defile you you can sin with your tongue easy right your other members perhaps weren't sinning <laughs> your arms your legs your eyes you were doing okay they're okay but when you speak forth words a lot of sin happens with people's words and it can defile the whole body you know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's set on fire, it sets on fire the course of nature so it can quickly um, spread and hurt and do damage. And it's set on fire of hell. Now, remember, Peter, he spoke to the Lord, he had a word from the, the Lord that he was the Messiah. Jesus said, you didn't receive this from man, but you received it from my Father. You're blessed. Now, right after that, Jesus is talking about going to be, he talks about being, um, he's going to be taken to the cross. He's going to die. He's going to be turned over to these wicked rulers. They're going to put him to death. And Peter says, not so, Lord. You know, he tries to counsel him. Don't do it. And Jesus, what did he say? He said, get behind me, Satan, for you don't savor, you don't desire God's will, but you, you know, you're speaking forth the will of man. And so one minute he has a word from the Holy Spirit about a revelation about who Jesus is. And it's given to his heart and he speaks it out. The next minute he's spoken to by the devil. And he speaks those thoughts out. That's why we're to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So James is saying that your tongue can be set on fire by hell. It means your tongue can be demonically influenced. Because Satan is there to inject, and it may not be him personally, it may just be one of his minions, but that devil is there to get you to speak a non-faith filled word and it can create all sorts of injury and damage that's why we're to be slow to speak and quick to hear and we are to hear, learn to hear the still small voice of the holy spirit and be careful with what words we do speak because we can speak forth in, uh, in a hell-bound word very quickly and create a firestorm you ever spoken words that you wish you could take back because of the controversy it creates and the hurt that just went out i i've done it frequently unfortunately and i'm still learning um but the lord is faithful and he shows me my error and again we have to stay humble in this matter um and be careful now going on it says for every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and have been tamed of mankind all right so now you know animals have been tamed by men and he's comparing the tongue now to animals being tamed 
but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. All right, so we can speak blessings, we can speak cursings out using the same tongue. And he's saying here that no man can tame the tongue, and that's, that's in and of our own strength, I think is what James means here. A man submitted to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he quickens our mortal bodies by the Spirit that dwells in us. And that's a man who reckons himself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're to be led by the Spirit of God and not by the flesh. We're to, we, you know, they that are in the flesh cannot please God, it says in Romans 8. So we're to reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in Romans 6, it's, it says, don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So we have a part in yielding our members as instruments of righteousness unto God. We can only do that by being led by the Spirit of God. He quickens our mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwells in us. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So we are to be led by the Spirit of God. He will quicken our mortal bodies, and he will help us. We just have to yield our will to him, and he'll do the rest. So we can't do it by our own accord, but when we're yielded to the Lord, and we walk in humility, the Lord will tame that tongue for us. That's the attitude you have to be walking in, my dear brother and sister is yield that yield your will to him and walk with him in humility every day be sensitive take those thoughts captive don't just speak them out be careful what you speak and you know if you if you have misspoken be quick to make amends be quick to make it right so you know we can because we don't want to be in this situation blessing god Going to church, blessing God, praising God. Yes, I love God. And, there, and then we go ahead and we curse men who are made in the image of God. Those things ought not be. So out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. Yeah, then my brethren, these things ought not be so. Do the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? No, the, the water is separated. It can't send forth both at the same time. You either get sweet water or clean, fresh, good water, or you get bitter water that's been contaminated with something that makes it undrinkable. Can the fig tree, here he's comparing it to trees now again, my brother, and bear olive berries? No, it's not in the DNA of the fig tree to create an olive berry. No, it's, that's not how God designed it. It has DNA instructive code that when the fig tree grows, it, the fruit that it's going to grow is programmed in by our Creator to grow figs, not olive berries. Either a vine, figs, no, a vine will grow grapes, not figs, programmed in to grow grapes. So, can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh? Right? Again, it's either fresh water. Or salt water the two are separate you know you can have the brackish water I know that there is a transition from fresh to salt um, as salt runs into the oceans it's picking up minerals it's it's turning salty but when you're in a fountain it's only gonna bear one kind of water it's gonna have isolated water drinkable or non drinkable so, anyway, that is what James has to say about words and how important words are. And it will reveal your spirituality. It will reveal your intimacy with the Lord. If there's anything that will expose a man more spiritually, it's words. I don't know if I said that right, but my meaning is your words will determine, will show what's proceeding from your heart for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks all right now 
we will move on. We'll go back to 12, verse 38. Then the scri certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Okay? Now, remember, just a few verses before, he healed the dumb man and the blind man. He had a devil, and he was blind and dumb in verse 22. And he, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw, and the people were amazed. Is not this the son of David? And now, you know, the Pharisees start this controversy about these works being done by Beelzebub. So Jesus exposes their hearts in verses 33 through 37, saying that um, the evil thoughts are evil fruit, and they proceed from an evil heart. Okay, now they're saying again, we would see a sign of thee. You know, there's, is there, what sign would convince them? How many miracles do they have to see? You know, the, the, in, in John 6, they wanted Jesus, who had just fed the, the 5,000 or, you know, fed the multitudes with bread. They wanted, they sought him more for more bread. And they wanted another sign. What sign do you give us? You know, Moses gave us bread in the wilderness. You know, are you greater than Moses? You know, he gave it to him every day. Well, yeah, he's greater than Moses. You know, here he's doing all these healings. You know, how many signs? There's no signs. There is not enough miracles that would satisfy these Jews. And... Here they, they continue because their hearts are set against him. They do not want to humble themselves. They want to be large and in charge. They want to be the men running the show. They love their sin. They're unwilling to come to the light. And they're unwilling to humble themselves. So here again they, they're saying, show us a sign. It's almost like a, a defensive tactic to... Um, to get Jesus off from shining the light on their hearts and exposing their sin. Now, he, he answers and says unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And we'll, we'll get into that here in a minute. Um, let's look at verse... Well, let's read the rest of these real quick, up to 42. For as Jonas, or Jonah... The prophet Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation. So this is all talked about in the, the prophet's letter, Jonah, in the Old Testament. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they rep repented at the preaching of, of Jonah and behold a greater than Jonah is here the Queen of the South shall rise up this is the Queen who came to hear Solomon's words uh, when Solomon was king so the Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with his generation and shall condemn it for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold a greater than Solomon is here all right so so in verse 38, they say, we would see a sign from thee. And let's look at Luke 16. You know, again, here, here's something in Luke 11, 16. It says, and others tempting him sought of him a sign from heaven. So again, this common theme, you know, and it's, it's similar. It looks like the similar account of calling him casting out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of devils. So there, you know, this theme of him doing his miracles by Beelzebub, the chief of devils. So they're tempting him, testing him. You know, what did Jesus say to the devil? Thou shalt not put the Lord thy God to the test. Right? So they're testing him, tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. Again in Luke down further in, in verse 29 through 32. He says, this is an evil and adulterous generation that seek after a sign and no sign shall be given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was, was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South shall rise up 
in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth she came from a long distance to hear the wisdom of solomon and behold a greater than solomon is here you know these guys have jesus in their backyard and they're calling him doing saying his works are from beelzebub or the devil the queen of the south comes from probably northern africa and she comes this great distance to hear probably ethiopia probably you know to hear jesus's words or solomon's words a lesser of lesser value although wise we have some we have solomon's writings in ecclesiastes and in proverbs or in song of solomon um she comes this great distance to just hear solomon but jesus's words are greater than hers his and these guys have jesus in their backyard much closer so the men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. They, you know, Jesus is saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They're not listening to him. Jonah goes to a wicked na nation or a wicked city of Nineveh, preaches repentance that not even. He just says God is going to destroy this city for its evil in 40 days. And they take it upon themselves to repent. The whole reason Jonah didn't want to go is because of the thought that they might repent. <laughs> and God has a heart of mercy. And that's what God wanted to do. He wanted to show kindness. He delights in mercy. He doesn't desire. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But that the wicked would turn and live. It says in Ezekiel 18. Turn ye, turn ye. Why will you die, O house of Israel? I have no delight, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So, that's God's heart. And now, let's, let's continue on. A sign commonly signifies... A sign commonly signifies a miracle. Kind of trying to get back to my place here. So, yeah. A sign commonly signifies a miracle. That is a sign that God was with the person or had sent him. Now, there's some notes in Isaiah 7.11. Let's just look at the verse. As, ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in depth or in the height above. So he's talking to Ahaz. And he's saying that, go ahead, ask for a sign. And... But Ahaz was more respectful. He said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. But here the Lord is saying, go ahead, ask. <laughs> and uh, he wanted Ahaz to ask. And he gave this prophecy that a virgin would, shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So this is the sign that the Lord is going to show. And um, that was the sign the Lord chose. But he's not just going to act at the whim of man he's not like a genie in the bottle that um is you going to give you your three wishes you don't command god that way uh but god will give signs not at his not at a person's will but at his will and in his way um so anyway so luke adds that this was done tempting him so we saw that they did this their whole motive was tempting him in verse 16 they were tempting him jesus said this is a sign of an, a wicked and adulterous generation so they're testing him doubting if he had the power to do it if these persons had been present with him for any considerable time they had already seen sufficient proofs that he was what he claimed to be they might have been, however, those who had recently come, and then the emphasis must be laid on we, we as well as the others would see a proof that thou art the Christ. In either case, it was a temptation. If they had not seen him work a miracle, yet they should have believed it by testimony, right? Because these miracles weren't done in a closet. They weren't done in a box. They were done out in the open. They weren't done in secret or in the dark. They were done out in the open for all to see. 
So even if they were new in town and maybe hadn't seen one, um, they should have heard and believed. So if they had not seen him work a miracle, yet they should have believed it by testimony, compare, you know, and then they just want, I got to see it with my own eyes before I'll believe, right? So they were testing the Lord. Let's look at John 20, 29. Jesus said unto them, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So this is a, this is a rule that goes on till today. You know, a lot of people want to see Jesus. They, they, you know, they won't believe unless they see Jesus in the flesh or in person. That's what Thomas was like. That's not the normal mode of operation the Lord wants to work in. That's not walking in faith to have to see an open vision of the Lord. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Jesus here says, he rebukes Thomas because Thomas said, I won't believe until I am able to put my hands in his side and my fingers and in, in the wounds in his hand and Jesus, he gets rebuked by Jesus. And uh, he says, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So we're not to be the ones who run after the visions and the encounters with Jesus in the flesh or in open vision. Now, these things can happen. They do happen. The, the word of God says that in the end days in Joel, that old men are going to dream dreams. Young men are going to have open visions. Um, and that God will communicate that way. He does communicate that way. But that's not the norm. And it's better, it's better to believe on what God has said and what Jesus has said about himself. Rather than say, you know, drawing a line in the sand, testing God, tempting God and saying, I will not believe unless you speak to me audibly or you show yourself to me physically. That is not, that's testing the Lord. That's tempting the Lord. We're not to do that. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. So there's a greater blessing in believing on what Jesus said and who he is and who he said he was and what is the truth than having an open vision of him according to jesus's words all right so perhaps perhaps however the emphasis is to be laid on the words from heaven they might profess not to doubt that his miracles were real but that they were not not quite satisfactory they were desirous of seeing something therefore that should clear up their doubts where there could be no opportunity for dispute. A comet, or lightning, or thunder, or sudden darkness, or the gift of food raining upon them, as in, you know, what they were talking about in John 6. You know, Moses, he, it wasn't Moses, it was God, but Jesus, it, you know, brought the manna from heaven. You know, it wasn't Moses who fed the people. But, they were trying to get him to do some great miracle like a comet or lightning or thunder. And, you know, remember, God did speak in thunder. Men, men heard his audible voice, but some mistakenly thought it was thunder. And others thought it was an angel. And Jesus said, he didn't, you know, God didn't speak for my benefit. He spoke for yours. You know, there, you know, God will do that at times. At times when you're not asking and it's unexpected. It's at his will and his discretion. So, all right. So they supposed that these type of miracles would be decisive. Possibly they referred in this to Moses. He had been with God amid thunders and lightnings. And he had given them manna, bread from heaven to eat. They wished Jesus to show some miracle equally undoubted. So it's a constant point of contention the Jews bring up. And anyway, that's not God, you know, Jesus did provide these miracles, just not at their request when they wanted it, but they were often performed. And so there was something different that was holding them back. They were, they were bouncing to this to, to give them a reason not to believe on what Jesus was saying. 
because they enjoyed the darkness that they were walking in. They were resisting the truth. They were, as Romans 1 says, suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. All right, now, Matthew 12, 39. But he answered and said unto them, An adulterous and an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. So the relation of the Jews to God was often represented as a marriage contract. God as the husband and the Jewish people as the wife. And this can be borne out in Isaiah 57, 3. It says, But draw near hither, ye sons of the sorceress, sorceress, the seed of the adulterer, and the whore right so it's a there's a, a committing of a spiritual adultery or playing the harlot um, so you're married to God and this is the figurative language the Lord uses with him and his people when they go astray Hosea 3 1 I think Hosea might even God had him marry a harlot it says in Hosea 3 1 then said the Lord unto me go yet love a woman beloved of her friend yet an adulteress according to the love of the lord toward the children of israel who look to other gods and love flagons of wine right so the children of israel's heart was looking to other gods and love flagons of wine so it says love a woman beloved of her friend yet an adulteress so he's telling hosea to go love a woman that's an adulteress and this is in relation to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel. So he's wanting Hosea to experience what it feels like to be married to an adulterous woman. To have feelings for an adulterous woman. That's what God, his feelings are hurt when we go towards sin. And we look to, you know, here the children of Israel are looking to other gods. You know, they didn't bring him bring him out of Egypt. You know, God did ten judgments on Egypt against all the gods of Egypt, showing him that he was God, not the little demons that they worshipped. No, he was the God of gods, the true God, the creator, uh, the I am. And so now Hosea is going to experience what God feels, the hurt, the pain, of what happens in an adulterous marriage wow now Ezekiel 16 15 but thou didst trust in thine own beauty and played the harlot because of thy renown and pourest out thy fornications on every one that passed by his it was all right so again Ezekiel sent speaking to the children of Israel who are pouring out their fornications on everyone that passed by so they're playing the harlot spiritual adultery going uh, after sin not turning to god but turning to the other nations around them the other false gods around them they're playing the spiritual harlot against their heavenly husband the lord the great i am Hence, their apostasy and idolatry are often represented as adultery. This, this is the meaning that Jesus had, saying that they're an evil and adulterous generation. They were evil and unfaithful to the covenant or to the commandments of God, an apostate and corrupt people. There is, however, evidence that they were literally an adulterous people. And he says here, there shall no sign be given to it. So they sought some direct miracle from heavens. Jesus replied that no such miracles should be given. He did not mean to say that he would work no more miracles or give no more evidence that he was the Christ, but he would give no such miracle as they required. He would give one that ought to be as satisfactory evidence to them that he was from God as the miraculous preservation of Jonah was to the Ninevites then he was divinely commissioned remember Jonah showed up on the shore spit up out of the ba the whale whale's belly probably all white and pasty having uh, experienced a near-death experience being in the stomach acid of a whale 
that in and of itself is a miraculous sign to the Ninevites saying, how did this man survive being in the, in the sea, in this whale's belly for three days and three nights, and he physically looks the part. <laughs> God has preserved him and sent him. So as Jonah was preserved three days by miracle and then restored alive, so he would be raised from the dead after three days. This is Jesus likening himself to Jonah's experience proceeding out of the whale's belly. As on the ground of this preservation, the Ninevites believed Jonah and repented. So on the ground of his resurrection of Jesus, the people of an adulterous and wicked generation ought to repent. This is a greater sign. And believe that he was from God. That was going to be the miracle of miracles, that he was going to go into the grave and he was going to return to life. He was going to be resurrected. Just as Nineveh uh, responded to Jonah, having survived a for sure death experience, being swallowed by a great fish. I'm using whale. It could have been a whale shark. It could have been a, a shark or something like that. I'm not sure. Um, but it was a miraculous sign. Well, Jesus being openly crucified and then being resurrected and witnessed by all the apostles and the 500 disciples in 1 Corinthians 15. There were many, many miracles. You know, that should have been a great, grandiose sign. And God gave them that sign that they might believe. And repent. So the sign of the prophet Jonah means the sign or evidence which was given to the people of Nineveh that he was from God, to wit that he had been miraculously preserved and was therefore divinely commissioned. The word Jonas is the Greek way of writing the Hebrew word Jonah or as is Elias. That's the Greek way of writing the name Elijah. Okay, verse 40. For as Jonah was three days, and there's a verse here we should we should pull up. John 1 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So anyway, we're gonna that was uh, recommended here by Albert Barnes. This event took place in the Mediterranean Sea where Jonah went into the ocean, somewhere between Joppa and Tarshish. When he was fleeing from Nineveh, it is said that the whale seldom passes into, the, into that sea and that its throat is too small to admit a man. It is probable, therefore, that a fish of the shark kind is intended. Sharks have been known often to swallow a man entire. I think a great white will do that. The fish in the book of Jonah is described merely as a great fish, which, without specifying the kind. It is well known that the Greek word translated whale in the New Testament does not of necessity mean a whale, but may denote a large fish or sea monster of any kind. That's from the Robinson lexicon. Now, he's going to be there three days and three nights. It will be seen in the account of the resurrection of Christ that he was in the grave, but two nights... Okay, this... Um, this is, uh, talking, he's talking, we've talked about this timing in another video and Jesus was in the, the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And it was, um, he went, he was crucified on a Wednesday. He went into the tomb at sunset on that Wednesday, which was the Passover he was in, that was the beginning of the Jewish day, was at sundown. And then the next day, so that Wednesday night and Thursday would have been a Sabbath, the Passover. So that was the first day and the first night, Wednesday night. Then Thursday night was the second night. Friday night was the third night. And then Thursday night, he actually rose from the dead at sundown. And that would have completed the third day. But he wasn't seen until Sunday morning by the women who went uh, to redress the body. And that's when the tomb was op saw opened. But he actually rose that night, um, but wasn't seen 
until Sunday morning. So that would be three nights and three complete days that he was in the heart of the earth. And just as Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 12. So he accomplished three days and three nights. So Jesus was not crucified on a Friday, which, you know, has been held by the Catholicism, the Catholic Church for centuries. Um, and it wasn't Good Friday. It wouldn't, the timing doesn't match. So, uh, but Michael Rood's done a, a great study on this and, and others and shown that actually we can go back you know in a chronological Bible and find out the exact day that he was crucified I believe it was AD 28 in Michael Rood's uh, timing and um, yeah he he went in on a Wednesday night so Wednesday night Thursday night Friday night that's three nights and then Wednesday sundown to Thursday sundown that's one day Thursday sundown to Friday sundown that's two days Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, that's three days. So you got three days, three nights, just as Jesus said, and that he was in the heart of the earth. The Jews use the word heart to denote the interior of a thing or to speak of being in a thing. It means here to be in the grave or sepulcher. But he went into Hades, which is in the heart of the earth. Hades has a couple of compartments where the righteous dead and the unrighteous go and um i you know i'm not sure uh where he went he he i think it was still uh reckoned a defeat by him going into the unrighteousness part i don't know how uh i don't know exactly what part of hades he was in in the heart of the earth let's just leave it at that i know there's different theories out there um, but i believe that it was looked at as if he had defeated because he made an open show of satan so satan thought he had the victory i think until the third day when jesus was about to rate when he finally rose from the dead it said he made an open show of him publicly and he led captivity captive which means those who he led the captors into captivity so i believe that that's when it was like a nuclear bomb going off in hades when jesus actually rose from the dead and god called him up and put him back in his heavenly body so um yeah so satan i think was going to gloat that he had won and over jesus down there in hades and just at the time when all his minions were assembling, Jesus rose from the dead and there was a lot of spiritual carnage. And I think a lot of the deformation, you see the ugly creatures when, you, when demons do expose themselves, it's because there was a lot of mangling that went on when Jesus rose from the dead. Now that's my own reading between the lines there, so you know, don't take that for doctrine. But anyway... Um, hallelujah Jesus rose and defeated the devil and took the keys of hell and death and that Adam lost and he's got them well in hand right now so uh, let's see let's just finish this part here now the men of Nineveh Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire it was founded by Asher Ashur in Genesis 10:11. Let's see where that is. I don't seem to have that. Oh, there it is. Genesis 10, 11. Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh in the city Rebo, Rehoboth, and Kala. So it was founded by Asher. It was situated in the banks of the river Tigris to the northeast of Babylon. It was a city of vast extent and of corresponding wickedness. It was 48 miles in circumference its walls were a hundred feet high wow and 10 feet thick and were defended by 1500 1500 towers each 200 feet in height wow so that's 20 stories and there's 1500 of these towers around this 48 miles 
circumference of the city. It wasn't a circle, but it was probably rectangles. It contained in the time of Jonah, it is supposed, 600,000 inhabitants. So a city of 600,000. The destruction of Nineveh threatened by Jonah in 40 days was suspended by their repentance. Yeah, so it was 40 days to re till destruction was to arrive. It was suspended by their repentance for 200 years. So God was willing to suspend it for 200 years. It was then overthrown by the Babylonians about 600 years before Jesus. So about 600 B.C. During the siege, a mighty inundation of the river Tigris took place, which drew down a part of the walls through which the enemy entered and sacked and destroyed the city. This destruction had been foretold 115 years before by Nahum the prophet in Nahum 1.8. It says, But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. This is speaking of Nineveh. But, yeah, but with an overwhelming flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof. So, and Nahum 2.6 also talks about it. It says, The gates of the rivers shall be opened, and the palace shall be dissolved. Its ruins have been lately discovered by Layard. So, he's talking in the 1800s as these were discovered. And have contributed much to the establishment of the truth of script, Scripture history. So, I know... I believe uh, um, uh, Saddam Hussein was rebuilding the ancient city of Nineveh. Is that right? Am I getting that right? No, that was Babylon. I'm not getting that right. My fault. I'm getting a little tired here. So, anyway, it was discovered by Layard, probably in the late 1800s. So those remains are on the east side of the River Tigris, nearly opposite to this to the city of Mosul so maybe I am thinking close to that yeah Mosul is in Iraq so it's it's in modern day Iraq anyway that's a archaeology geography discussion for a later time now back to what Jesus is saying so uh, they are going to condemn it the when the judgment happens, these residents of Nineveh who repented will condemn this generation, Jesus' generation, the Jews. That is, their conduct in repenting under the preaching of Jonah shall condemn this generation. They, ignorant and wicked pagan, repented when threatened with temporal judgment by a mere man, Jonah. But you Jews, professing to be enlightened through, though, threatened... For your great wickedness with eternal punishment by the Son of God, a far greater being than Jonah, repent not, and must therefore meet with a far heavier condemnation. So much greater than Jonah comes, he warns them, the Son of God, and they don't, they don't turn. Jonah, a nobody, just a man, goes and saves a city of 600,000 people because they, because they humble themselves. In the sight of the Lord. Wow. So you can imagine on God's scale of, of justice the the judgment that's going to be meted out. Those who have been given more light, Jesus said, are going to be held to a higher standard than those who have been given little light. And you know, they're still going to be um, judged, but they're going to be held to a different standard than those who have been given greater light. To whom much is given, much is required. Now, in verse 42 now, the queen of the south, that is the queen of Sheba. This is 1 Kings 10.1. And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. Sheba was probably a city of Arabia situated to the south of Judea. Okay, so I thought it was Ethiopia, but he's saying it's city of Arabia. And he's referencing Isaiah 60, verse 6. The multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. All they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring golden incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. Okay, that makes sense. Now, he says from the uttermost parts of the earth. This means simply from the most distant parts of the habitable world then known. 
see a similar expression in Deuteronomy 28:49. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. So as this is as the knowledge of geography was limited, the place was in fact by no means in the extreme parts of the earth. It means that she came from a remote country and she would condemn that generation for she came a great distance to hear the wisdom of Solomon. But the Jews of that age would not listen to the wisdom of one much greater than Solomon though present with them. Okay, so that is where we are going to end it right now. So again, Jesus a much greater than Jonah. They're, they're challenging him for a sign. And Jesus is telling them the sign that they're going to be given, that God is, is going to be good with. He's going to give them the sign uh, of Jonah, similar to what Jonah experienced. The Son of Man is going to do something greater because he is greater. He's going to go into the heart of the earth three days and three nights, be raised from the dead, and come back. He's going to defeat death, and he's going to uh, make an open show of Satan, taking the keys of death and of hell, of Hades, away from him and restoring what man had lost making a way back to god being an atonement for sin and hallelujah thank you lord jesus um so he's not going to he calls him an evil and adulterous generation seeking after a sign for the wrong reasons they already had enough evidence they were just unwilling to believe but god in his mercy gives many many signs the greatest of which is jesus defeating death um and he's going to show that at the end right so that's the wonderful ending to this story his story all right so we'll end it there friends thanks for tuning in and we will see you in the next study god bless you till then